Today I want to tell you a story, the story of a language and its people. Once upon a time, there is an island called Celador, and one day a few families arrive in boats and settle here. After a few centuries, there are a couple of small towns and nomadic tribes all over the island. At first, they all spoke the same language, but little by little it has been changing differently in different places. For example, the west of the island is full of forests, and the people who live there use wood to make their houses. For this reason, the word for carpenter, largim, has also come to mean house builder or architect. The same did not happen in the north of the island, which is very dry. People here cannot use wood to make their houses, so instead they use bricks or other rocks. For this reason, they have developed a different word for architect, eter masel, which literally means house builder. However, the people from the west have started using the word etur less and less. Now they call houses literally wooden boxes, which in their language is ishter. For them, the word etur has become very archaic, like a very old word that only old people use. And in a few generations, they will probably not even know what it means anymore. And yet, the people from the north still use the word largem to mean carpenter. So when they hear people from the west using that word in that context, they have no problem. But as soon as the people from the west start using that word in the context of building houses, it makes the people from the north very confused. This was just one example, with just two concepts, house and house builder. But similar changes have been happening all over the island. People who live close by can probably still understand each other, but people who live very far away would probably have no idea what the other person is saying. However, this is not an issue at this point, because, I mean, people from the north are not going to be making houses with the people from the west anytime soon, so the differences in their languages are not an issue. But this is about to change. Because deep in the central plains, a man and a woman have just unified all the nomadic tribes. And now they call themselves the King and Queen of Celador. Soon they start expanding their power, and either by force or diplomacy, soon all the island is under their control. Now, you might be wondering, how did people manage to negotiate and communicate in these situations? After all, the people from the plains certainly do speak different languages from people in other parts of the island. But the funny thing is that when it comes to these matters of life and death, people do find a way to overcome the language barrier every time. There are many ways to overcome the language barrier. For example, in one instance, the messengers found a couple of traveling merchants. These merchants had learned the different languages of the people of a region of the island because they traveled so much, and so they were hired by the messengers as translators in every town they arrived. In another instance, when the messengers arrived to a town in the north, they couldn't understand the local people and there was no one available to translate, but one of the messengers was really good at learning languages. So after a couple of days, he started to pick up the language of these people and he was able to give them the message of the king and queen of Celador. And in yet another instance, when the messengers arrived to a town in the east, people were having a really hard time understanding them. But this very old woman heard them speaking, and she recognized in their words some words that her mother used to say a long, long time ago, and she was able to recall those memories from her childhood and understand what these people were saying. Now, what were these people saying? Well, the message was simple. The king and queen of Celador wanted representatives from all over the island to come to their court. These people would be given the laws of the new kingdom and they would be sent back to keep those laws. And so it was that either by force or by peace, people from all over the island were sent to the court of the king and queen of Celador to become the ministers of the new nation. But there was a problem. As the ministers started hearing the king and queen speak, well, they couldn't understand what they were saying. 
and the king and queen could not understand what the ministers were saying. And even worse, the ministers couldn't understand each other. How were the ministers going to understand the laws they had to keep? How were the king and queen going to understand the complaints of their people? And how were the ministers going to work together to rule the nation? Well, turns out that the king and queen didn't have to worry too much. After a couple of weeks of living with the tribe, the ministers started to realize that the language these people were using wasn't very different from their own. After all, all of their ancestors spoke the same language, remember? So now the ministers could see that this language was just like their own, just with funny words and funny sounds. And the best part is that now that all of the ministers have learned the language of the king and queen, they can also use this language to speak with each other. Finally, now that there is a common language, the ministers and the royals can focus on creating a government. A couple of months go by. There were a lot of discussions on the administration of the new kingdom. A lot of things were decided, a lot of orders were given. Now, the ministers have to go back to their towns in order to rule them in the name of the king and queen and according to their laws. Among other things, they will collect taxes, if necessary, they will raise levies for the army, they will be judges and many other similar things. But for now, let's follow just one of them. Her name is Arham and she's going back to the town of Tuhrim. As she arrives, she discovers that she's famous now. Not only is she the new local ruler, but she has also met the king and queen in person. Everyone admires her and asks favors of her. But only her close family dares to tell her one thing. She speaks kind of funny now. She spent so many months in the court of the royals learning to speak like them that a few things stuck. Perhaps an accent, or a few initial words, or maybe some uncommon pronunciations. People notice, and soon this funny way of speaking becomes a mark of prestige. Only the people who are close to the royalty speak this way. For this reason, everyone in town wants to imitate this way of speaking. But of course, those who spend more time with Arham learn to imitate it the best. And to Arham's newborn children, it won't be an imitation. This will become their actual way of speaking. The same will be true of their children and the children of their children. In time, they will become the new aristocracy and they will have their own way of speaking, different from their subjects. One day, another minister arrived in town. He was Tersel from Sergim, a town deep in the mountain forest. He wanted to see Arhan, but people couldn't understand what he was saying because they spoke the shore dialect and he spoke the mountain dialect. And so he switched to the royal dialect and now people could understand him enough to direct him to Arhan's house. Arham didn't spoke the mountain dialect either, but they had met when the king and queen summoned them. They learned to speak the royal dialect together and they can understand each other perfectly when using it. In comparison, Arham's family can understand the conversation eh, well enough, but the peasants who have spent very little time talking to Arham and other people in her social circle haven't learned how to speak this way. And so if they heard the conversation between Arham and Tersel, they would understand little to none of it. Centuries pass. The Saladorians start making new inventions that facilitate communication. And as a result, the royal dialect has influenced local languages and dialects more and more. In some cases, it has outright replaced them. Before, people who lived just a couple of kilometers away couldn't understand each other, like the mountain and shore dialects. But now, people from across the country can understand each other just fine when using the royal dialect. And yet, they don't use it in the same way. For starters, they have different accents, of course. And they also use some words from their old dialects. And finally, the royal dialect has had many small changes all over the country. For this reason, the royal dialect, spoken by the aristocracy from the central plains, 
is still the standard used by the government, since the small differences can be very important. For example, once a minister sent a message asking for a thousand trainers for the army, and she got a thousand people to train the army, when instead she meant a thousand sport shoes. You see, in her dialect, they call those kinds of shoes trainers because that's what you use when you train. For this reason, it was no surprise when the king and queen of the plains decreed that all government employees had to pass a test of basic knowledge of their royal dialect. A few more centuries go by, and as different regions of the island start to industrialize and become richer, they don't like being ruled by the still nomadic royal elite. Soon, their own particular ways of speaking, which were seen as uneducated and vulgar, become a point of pride. They start using them in their local governments and they start to criticize people who don't use them. Revolution looms. Many decades of revolution have torn the island apart and now it is divided into many nations. One of them is the Republic of Turhimsa, and they declare that their own local dialect is the new official language. They declare one of their cities to be the new capital, and they invite representatives from all of their towns and cities to write the new constitution. And soon they have the same problem that the royals of the plains had almost a thousand years ago. Even though they have their own way of speaking, which is different from the rest of the island, there are differences within their language too. People speak it differently in different regions of their new country and even in different towns and cities. These differences might be small, but with the creation of the new constitution, the interpretation of every single sentence must be absolutely clear if they want this to be the basis of law for their country for centuries to come. And so they decide to write it in the style of the people from the capital. And in this way, the dialect of the capital becomes implicitly the official dialect of the official language of the new nation. In other places of the islands, the local aristocracies have managed to remain in power, like in the kingdom of Ohre, which has become a parliamentary monarchy. The aristocracy in this nation are people who were taught their whole lives to imitate the aristocracy from the plains. How they ate, how they spoke, how they acted. They were taught that the nobility were inherently superior and had to be obeyed. As a result, they continue to speak in the royal dialect and they continue the royal customs. In their minds, this makes them inherently superior and people should obey them. But they are wrong. The subjects don't like the royal customs. They have their own culture and they are tired of being ashamed of it. They don't like the royal dialect. They can barely understand it. They think it is pretentious and entitled and they see nothing wrong with the way they speak. And so when they go to vote for the representatives in the parliament, they listen to the candidates and either consciously or subconsciously, they vote for the candidates who speak like them the most. In a couple of decades, the subject dialect will be renamed the common dialect, and it will be made the official language of the government and education, but it will still not be hard to find rich old people who cling to the old royal dialect, and once in a while there are movements to try to bring it back. In the Federation of Elhim, people remember how they used to have their own language almost a thousand years ago, before the king and queen of the plains. The old language was forgotten, but not lost. And a few nerds here and there have learned the old language from the old books. And now, in these times of revolution, going back to the ancient language doesn't seem so crazy. The nerds teach this language to a few people and all of them are sent as teachers to the towns and cities of Elhim. Mothers and fathers learn it in their free time, they practice it with each other, they speak it to their children, and the children learn it in school. Soon, the old language is alive, 
The old jokes are funny once more, the forgotten sounds that had not been heard in a thousand years resonate in the old temples again. Meanwhile, in Ulshintur, people still speak the old royal dialect. For them, it is simply the normal way to speak. They don't see it as pretentious or entitled, it is simply the way they have spoken their whole lives. But oddly enough, they don't see any kind of special connection between the old conquerors and themselves, it's just an accident of history. And yet, in the Mandate of Norgum, they don't know what should be their official language of the government and education. Should they choose the dialect of the rich people that resembles more the old royal dialect? Or should they choose the dialect that most people actually speak? An earth travels the countryside, she listens how the common people speak, and she decides to create a new dialect, one that can be understood by the common people, but that resembles more the old royal dialect. At first, the government is enthusiastic, both rich and common people have to learn it. It is a compromise. Uh, the problem is that both rich and common people have to learn it, and neither does it really well. In the end, they have ended up combining their own dialects with this made-up dialect, creating two more dialects. And so now, the five dialects of Norgum get tied up into their ideas of hierarchy and social structure to the point that using the Grong dialect in the Grong social situation can be very embarrassing. But what are the rules? When should you use each dialect? The rules are not very clear and the speakers have a very hard time explaining it. This is a mess that no nerd dares to disentangle. And now we arrive at the present, where a little girl from one of these countries goes to school for the first time, and the teacher tells her that she's conjugating the verbs wrong, that she should do it some other way. And then this little girl asks, why? Why is it wrong? What should the teacher reply? Should the teacher try to explain how a long time ago their old royal dialect became the standard not because it was better, but simply because the people who spoke it had political power? Should the teacher try to explain how the political changes in the island have affected the standard dialects? Should the teacher try to explain how the class struggle has affected the prestige associated with those standard dialects? Should the teacher admit that no language and no dialect is superior to any other, but rather that one has to be chosen as a standard for purely practical reasons? Because it's wrong, replies the teacher. There's too much to teach and too little time. <laughs>